Thank you very much. Um, Sadhguruji, it's a great pleasure to be here with you. Namaskaram, William. Mm -hmm. Wonderful to talk, talk to you. As Thank I you. said, uh, all those books behind you scaring me that you're such a scholar. And I'm uh, <laughs> like this. <laughs> well, you're a powerful presence in a powerful landscape right now. I can see that both, you know, the landscape you're in is so beautiful and, and you're, you're seated in that landscape. And I think, you know, drawing something from that landscape. Uh, it's, it's been really good to meet you because I've heard about you from many friends of mine. And uh, before I even heard about you in the work of Isha Foundation, I saw the transformation in their lives as they became involved with the foundation and its work. And then when I asked them how, what was happening in their lives, they said, you know, they, they had encountered a wonderful force and that force was, was, force was you and, and the work of the foundation and it, and it really transformed their lives. And I, I know um, there are millions of people around the world who benefited so much they're, they're just passing the buck for their well-being to me. <laughs> that's very, uh, that, that's very uh, original of you, Sadhguruji, because they always say it's because of you that they, that they began a dialogue with themselves. And, and, you know, a very good friend of mine many, many years ago said that Sadhguru taught me to begin a dialogue with myself. And that's been something in, in the work, the meditation that I've done at the foundation has really helped me you know, make a path to myself, make a path to my inner self. And I thought that was a really profound and very beautiful thing they said about, about the path that you've chosen and the path that you've helped many people embark on. And so, you know, I thank you for that. There are only two things with our life. Uh, either one thing is the profoundness of our experience. Another is the impactfulness of our activity. This is all there is in our lives profoundness of experience, impactfulness of our activity. What else is there? There's nothing else. And, you know, as I was really intrigued, Sadhguruji, that, that you decided to get on a motorbike. I know, I know you love motorcycles and travel across America at a time like this. You know, it's, it's a time of great change in America and great, there, there seems to be a, a real outpouring of so many things. What are you seeing as you travel across America? America seems largely normal wherever you go, except uh, maybe theaters and restaurants are not much, but traffic on the highways are normal. Truck traffic is full on. People are moving about normally. A uh, whole lot of people are wearing masks. Some very brave people are going around without masks, okay, in some parts of the country. Uh, but essentially, almost everything seems to be normal uh, outwardly, and especially all these are, uh, right now I'm at the Grand Canyon, everything is jam-packed with tourists. When I inquired about, you know, we were in RV park and uh, it's all crowded, I asked, uh, what's happening so many people? So they were telling me, it is three times than what it is during a normal season. Everybody's traveling because children are going, not going to school, everybody's traveling and traveling is the uh, safest way to be because <laughs> you're away from everybody else, you're secluded. And especially for me, motorcycle is definitely social distancing, you know. <laughs> yes, that's, that's one advantage of a motorcycle. Unless you have someone riding on the back, of course. But uh, no, no. <laughs> your journey reminded me of, of a book uh, that I'd read uh, earlier on in my life when I was a student. Uh, and that book was about another motorcycle journey. It was, a, it was both a physical <laughs> journey and a spiritual journey. And, and the author was one of America's best known authors of the 20th century, Robert Persig. And, you know, he wrote, um, you know, he, he said something very profound in his book. He said, the only Zen you can find on the tops of the mountains is the Zen you take there. And he, he said that <laughs> in his motorcycle journey became like a story of, of a spiritual awakening. Um, have you found, how have you found people when they meet you in America? What has their reaction been? Well, uh, generally the reaction is initially of surprise because, uh, uh, they think uh, an Indian guru must be a little disabled, you know, he can't walk, he can't stand, he can't sit, he must be like that. And <laughs> except for chanting a mantra, he should not be able to do anything. So they're a little surprised in the beginning. But I think I've cooled their surprise uh, in the last few years, if they've known me even a little bit, uh, it's fine. And uh, I find uh, because, because of the identity, there's a safety, 
uh, you know, like uh, there's a little Sadhguru on my helmet with uh, my bl blood group and stuff like that. Because of that, even though I'm fully helmeted and they can't see my face, uh, people are recognizing on the, uh, on the roads and uh, shouting at me, waving at me, all this. Because uh, this is one thing I have changed that uh, from uh, guru means always demanding respect and reverence to a kind of uh, aspiration that uh, we could be like this. It is not like uh, I'm somebody that they cannot access. Like uh, even when little ch children, teenagers see me, they say, Hi Sadhguru, they won't say Namaskaram and bow down to me or something. They will shout at me and this and that, <laughs> which is a good thing that people are relaxing into the spiritual process rather than approaching it uh, being too constipated about everything. One, one of the interesting things I find, Sadhguruji, is that a lot of the people who have been influenced by the work of the Isha Foundation are business leaders and thought leaders in business. And, and I was interested when Business Insider came and said, you know, um, we, are, we want to do something uh, about sustainability in business and about, you know, a, a conversation between, between you and Sadhguruji on this idea of sustainability in business. What do you think about sustainability in business? Uh, definitely businesses or any human activity, if it has to sustain, it has to be managed in a way that, you know, it has a long-term uh, projection. But uh, right now, because uh, of our, uh, you know, like a free enterprise, which is a good thing that everybody is involved, we have moved from uh, what was uh, used to be called as capitalism, which means capital was available only for a small group of people to a market economy where everybody can participate. If anybody has a good idea and shows some ability to execute that idea, uh, capital will come to them today, at least with a little bit of struggle maybe, but it'll come to them, which was never possible 100 years ago or 200 years ago. At that time, let's say in India, probably 25 families held the capital. Nobody else had any possibility of ever getting any capital. In the United States, maybe 100 families held the capital. Nobody else was capable of raising capital. So one thing you see is a whole culture of crime in this country because they were trying to raise capital, you know, because only a few people held the capital. A few people holding the financial strings of an entire society itself is a crime. So that is changing with market economy. All kinds of entrepreneurs from a variety of backgrounds are coming and participating in the economic process, which is good. At the same time, because of the population growth from 20th century, from the beginning of 20th century, in uh, 1910, we were just 1.6 billion people. Today, we are 7.6 or 7.8 billion people, whatever the number. And uh, because of the number of people getting into economic activity and the consumption going high, it looks like business is the culprit. Business is not the culprit. Population is the culprit. But nobody wants to address that. Because uh, now even business people are saying big population is good for them because they're thinking numbers. They're not thinking of innovation. They're not thinking of uh, sustainability. They're only thinking of numbers. Quarter, uh, quarterly balance sheet to balance sheet they're going. Definitely all business leaders have to think a little more long term this quarterly balance sheet kind of push could cause serious damage to their own businesses and to the planet, of course. It is very easy to rattle off numbers about what is the damage this business right now, textile business, people will say it is causing this kind of damage, that kind of damage, which is true. I'm not saying no. That is because one thing is the number of people that we have. Another thing is our consumption has gone up because this more, more is better is not only in the minds of a business person, it is in the aspiration of every human being. So sustainability will not happen just because businesses think about it, because these are all related uh, relationships, how much you produce, how much they consume, how much they throw in the street, all these are related to a whole cultural experience of living in a given society. So changing that is going to is the whole mass movement. Right now, we are in the process of uh, looking at how to create a conscious planet. And it will not happen without a policy nudge 
I know none of the business people will like it. But at some point, some policy nudges have to come in terms of incentives and uh, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, penalty for not being a sustainable business. This is coming, but in a very slow manner. See, the problem is this, the degradation of the ecological condition on the planet, particularly in a country like India, because the population and the land uh, proportions are so unrealistic that the number of people who are trying to sustain themselves from the little bit of land that you have is uh, probably will pay the biggest price. We will pay the biggest price before any other nation or a few other Asian nations like Bangladesh and others will pay the price. I'm just saying that populations have increased. Everybody is talking how more population is better for business. Unfortunately, I hear this from so many business leaders. They don't understand that. With, see, right now here, the buffalo population. Uh, I went for a buffalo roundup in South Dakota. I asked them, what is this about? They rounded up about 1,500 buffaloes. And on that day, they're deciding how many buffaloes should be culled. So I'm saying you, you understand for a given piece of land, how much population of a particular species can exist. With other animals, you're taking the liberty of culling them. But with us, when we have postponed our death and increased our life expectancy, we must also postpone the birth. You cannot cull a human being, all right? But unfortunately, you will end up doing it because if you don't do it consciously, nature will do it to us in an extremely cruel manner. Uh, just to give you, if I have the time, is it okay? Yes, absolutely, Sadhguru. This is very interesting. For, exa for example, uh, right now in this, you can check it out. Probably you're already aware of this because cotton growing country uh, in southern India. In the peak summers, let's say in the month of mid-May, if you come to Tamil Nadu, where the borewells are going, 1,000 to 1,200 feet. Most pumps will run only for five to seven minutes, and they go dry. They will wait for another two, three hours, again pump five to seven minutes. If two consecutive monsoons fail, believe me, millions of people will die without water. Once there is a water strife, the civil strife that will happen, all the things that we are trying to do with the nation, building this nation into a powerful commercial force, an economic uh, possibility, all this will go waste in a matter of few weeks if real civil unrest breaks out in a large scale fashion. Nobody can control it. When people don't have water to drink, it will go off. So I'm telling you the worst case scenario. But the worst case scenario is not too far away because there is a record that once in every 35 to 37 years, two consecutive monsoons have failed in the past. So when is that situation going to come? Are we really capable of providing drinking water to every village if it goes dry? Every pond, every lake, every well, if it goes dry in summer, are we capable of piping water to all of them? Well, right now there is a huge project to lay pipelines, but that is all from the local water. If the local water dries up, pipeline also will be dry. You'll only have pipes, but no water. See, the aspirations of the nation, the plans of the leadership, and the business plans that business leaders have, everything is fine. I am very much with it. But if we do not take care of a few fundamentals of environmental sustainability, well, in a country like India, where the population and land ratio is so heavy, not favorable to the human beings, uh, the price that we pay will be very, very unfortunate. I, I feel either in this generation or the next generation, such things should not happen. So working on this is not just the responsibility of the business. Yes, business has a big responsibility. The government, the business, the uh, social leaders and uh, environmental uh, forces, we need to sit down and see what are the immediate steps we need to take. We've been trying to bring this and a few policy changes we have made in the last few years, which are good. But center makes policies, but the states hold the geography. All right. Center doesn't hold any geography. So a few states immediately incorporate. But now it's become like this in the country. It's, it's all everything is seen political. All right. Nobody is looking at the well-being of the people, well-being of the nation. If the central government says something, States ruled by opposition will say no. 
no matter what. I'm saying this must go both in the people, in the voters, in the political establishments, what is good for the country and what is a political slugfest. There must be a differentiation. Unfortunately, there isn't any. It doesn't matter what you say. Everything they identify you with this party, that party. This party is about the nation. We need to remember that. We just seem to have forgotten. Thank you for those inspiring words, Sadhguruji, because it seems like you're giving a call, a very powerful call to, to businesses. And, and I'm, I'm reminded of something you know, that Gandhiji, that we all read in school, that famous quote of Gandhiji that was painted on the ward, walls that said, God forbid that India should ever take to industrialization after the manner of the West, keeping the world in chains. If our nation took to similar economic exploitation, it would strip the world bare like locusts. And, you know, Gandhiji said this, and he also said, the world has enough for everybody's need, but not for everybody's greed. And it seems, you know, uh, you are echoing, you know, with this call, Sadhguruji, of yours, this call to business leaders, you're echoing that, look, we need to reinvent some of the rules of business, because if we continue with, from what I've heard you say today and, and before, that, you know, if we continue along this path, this path of mindless consumerism, we might end up stripping the world um, of all its resources. Um, and water being the most precious of those resources, but air is another one. And the environmental, uh, the environmental maybe crisis of our age is something, would you like to talk about that a little? Because it's something I think that business leaders need to hear from you about. This is something, uh, if I speak too strongly, uh, please pardon me because however strongly I speak, if I shout, it is still not enough. But I'm not going to shout. I was at the United Nations and they asked me, Sadhguru, if there are three things that you can suggest for India, what are the solutions? Three things that we should take care of. I said the three things are soil, soil and soil. That's our real problem. Everybody's thinking industry is the main problem. Industry throws effluence into the rivers. You can control it. If you tighten up your system, government system, you can control it in two years' time. Everything, all effluence. The only thing you have to do is don't ask the polluting industry to fix it. Set up treatment industry as an industry by itself. No polluting industry should treat their own waters. Treatment industry should treat it. When your pollution is my business, will I let you make it go into the river? I will not. About air. See, air is an issue because there are automobiles and automobiles on the road, because public transport is not efficient. It is not dignified to travel through public transport. Now, some Delhi metro, something else come where people say it is good. I have not been there. But largely, especially for women, it is not a dignified process to travel through public transport yet, unfortunately. We have not created that level of public transport. And for everything, we will talk socialistic steps. Why don't we make public transport a priority in the cities and make it... Uh, I know this will say, people will say, I'm working for economic segregation. I am a capitalist. I am corporate uh, guru, this, that nonsense. But I am saying the reason why particularly women don't want to travel through public transport and many others don't want to is by the time you reach office, you will be dripping sweat, all right? You don't want to go to your office like that and jostling and pushing and this and that. So why don't you make it that those who can afford, they pay at least 50% of what it costs for their car to be driven without the hassle of a car, you driving through the traffic. I'm saying much more expensive, properly air conditioned, no jostling, no standing, everybody sits in their seats and goes to their office. Still, there will be vehicles on the road, but that will be short term. All these Ubers and other things have come from where you drop off in a train to your office. Something can be done. Various possibilities are there. I'm not saying there's one magic wand solution, but we should reduce the number of vehicles on the road. Everybody wants to own a vehicle. Let them own a vehicle. But every day they need not use it. They can use it on the weekend when they want to take their family out or do something. Going to work 
especially now most people are working on their computers and stuff in the train itself you can work in the bus itself you can work all buses which are fitted with air conditioning and wifi people are traveling for 45 minutes one hour they can work and go the the employer also will be happy you are working on the way even if you come 10 minutes late who cares because you've been working one hour early so apart from this corporations i would request you also but you are not that kind of industry proper especially the software industry and industries which have large offices where let us say minimum 5000 10000 people are working in one setup say i was driving in san francisco i am seeing in the evening around 4:30 the traffic is jam packed on the road that i am driving and opposite side also it's packed up so i went for a talk in that uh, san francisco uh, club and uh, all the business people were there see i see what is it all i all of your intelligent people all right you guys have built big businesses obviously you got brains to do things why is it that people who live here work there and people who live there work here what is the point of this why are we not okay at one time it happened we didn't flower cities were not planned and it happened now i came up with a concept and said like for example in india and in bangalore i'm trying to push this with some builders 50 acres of land let it be even 50 or 75 or 100 kilometers away from the city 50 acres of land only one acre you build a tall building of 50 floors okay actually you have two fsi you can go 100 floors but let's say 50 floors remaining 49 acres turn it into a forest lakes ponds whatever you want no waste going out of this place no electricity lines coming into this place everything can be done right there so people live there work there up to seven standard school can be there small amount of shopping can be there five days in a week you don't step out of your building you don't start your automobile weekend you want to drive to the city or you want to go somewhere else it's up to you you're in a position where you can influence both business leaders and government leaders today do you think policy for example the policies that the government puts on businesses and farmers and tax policy also should be gauged by the impact a business has or an enterprise has on the environment so for example uh, you know one of the companies that we that we run is called organic india and it works with farmers and one of the things that we try to do is soil conservation now this is part of our um, mission to create create a sustainable business do you think that government should support those measures and say if i ran a business that produce something that was harmful for the environment harmful for human health as opposed to producing something that employed people in a in a way that didn't do any damage to the environment that maybe helped regenerate the environment do you think that there should be a clear like today any business person if you make a profit you are taxed whatever percentage on the profit that you make tomorrow government say that right if you have a business that will that will generate these social goods let us say you are running a business that creates compost out of waste those businesses will not be taxed and we will tax other businesses more heavily Do, are you an advocate of something like that sadguru ji so uh, what you are saying is globally relevant in the sense i would say next 7 to 8 years if uh, in the next whatever summit uh, 2020 there is to be a summit the ecological summit if all the governments agree next 7 to 8 years there must be heavy incentives for all those who restructure their businesses to be sustainable whatever those standards are and after 8 years there must be heavy penalty for those who do not restructure 8 years is a good amount of time for everybody to strive to turn their businesses around but it will not be fair if you treat the textile industry and let's say a uh, steel industry the same way an auto automobile industry the same way uh elaborate policies need to be arrived at depending on the sector of industry because some sectors naturally are polluting naturally are that kind okay but we all of us are using those products so if a elaborate policy can be brought out and then you say 8 years of time for you to turn around you have incentives and incentives for being sustainable but beyond 8 years of time if you don't turn around there is a heavy penalty to pay penalty is not in terms of 
imprisonment or something else, not like that. But as you said, taxes. Tax is a good way to, you know, business is trying to make profit. If you increase tax by even 2%, they will make uh, the necessary changes, all right? But incentives are the better way to go because incentives will bring innovation. Without innovation, just penalties are not good. Innovation must happen. And businesses must be given at least eight years time to innovate with incentives. If you are making serious innovations in your business, then tax reliefs must be there for you. So this evaluation, this may be very complex. It's easier said than done, but it's time we start that process for sure. So Sadhguruji, if, if, if you were to advise governments on policy and uh, there was an opportunity to put a waste tax so that if, if let's say you're buying a bag of potato chips, which is made in a, a, a plastic film a container. Now, one concept could be that you say that, okay, you're paying 30 rupees for the potato chips, but 10 rupees has to be for the guy who brings that empty container back to a recycling depot. Are you in favor of taxes on products that cannot be recycled easily, that have to be brought to recycling centers, like say a pair of running shoes? Now, there's a lot of synthetic material in that running shoe that if, you know, once I'm exploring somewhere and I found a trail and years ago, some must have thrown away a running shoe because many years later, it was still there. These, these Why did he run away without his shoes? I don't know. Why did the guy <laughs> run away with <laughs> I think the shoe had <laughs> and they left it there. But it's interesting that these are products that are sitting in the bottom of the ocean, sitting in the bottom of our rivers. They're polluting, you know, divers go down and they bring up this stuff. So do you think there should be some kind of incentive system so that anytime you buy a product which has a high degree of synthetic components in it that do not biodegrade easily, you, you have to pay, uh, th there is a sum of money to return that product to a recycling center. Do you think, in, in, because that could spawn a whole new set of industries in recycling, like employing hundreds of thousands of people in a, in a recycling industry. So, yeah, many innovations like this have been made in Russia and some of the in Moscow, I think, in the local trains. Uh, if you do 25 sit ups, your ticket comes free. That's a great idea. <laughs> How is that? <laughs> like this, there are many things, but they're too small scale to make a big difference. But in India, I hear more than 90% of the pet bottles are recycled, not because of anything else, because of poverty. People are going on the street and picking out every piece of plastic that is there. Uh, and you can unfortunately call this a kind of employment, but children uh, are involved, women are involved in most unhealthy conditions. Uh, we are, first of all, we are not uh, cultivating a responsible way of using the product. People keep on saying plastic must be banned, plastic must be banned. When I said, see, plastic is one of the best products we've come up with. Something that can be recycled a thousand times over is a great product. Irresponsible usage is what we need to correct. Right now, you want to throw the baby with the bath, bath water because there is a problem. Plastic is not the problem. Irresponsible human beings who don't know how to use plastic is the problem, isn't it? So bringing responsibility to the citizenry, giving incentives to the business, all these are needed. But I feel what you said just now, a potato chips, a packet, taking it back. I'm telling you in the United States, even if you say you will give $5 for, let's say you're paying uh, 4 to $5 for a potato chip. Even if you say I'll give back 50% of the money, most people will throw it in the trash can and go. They may not take the trouble of going back. So it all depends on the economic scale of a given yeah. society, where the society is. In India, they're picking up every pet bottle because for them, whatever 100, 200 rupees they gather in a day is a livelihood for them. So I, I don't think there is any one solution. Everything must be looked at. Incentives for the citizens, incentives for the business, the retail business, incentives for the manufacturers, and incentives for the government also. The world body should create incentives for the government if they make policies where it will hurt them a little bit, but long term, it's going to make a difference. Well, it's been fascinating, uh, Sadhguruji, this having this conversation, because I really feel very inspired for, you know, the work that you've done and as millions of other people around the world have seen. And 
and i just wanted to thank you very much for taking this time it's been you know great we got you off the motorcycle into a beautiful setting and <laughs> you gave us some really interesting words of wisdom so thank you very much for that i must i must say that uh, you're one guy single handedly you brought back uh, indian way of wearing clothes organic cotton and stuff back into the lives of indian youth thank you for that hmm? thank you very much for that i see it's made a huge difference